The greatest happiness of the greatest number is the foundation of morals and legislation. That's the central assertion of the moral philosophy known as utilitarianism, which seems to me to be far and away the most influential moral philosophy in the society in which we in Britain live. Whenever people professionally involved in politics or the civil service or any other field of public administration get together to discuss what to actually do, many, if not most, of the unspoken assumptions underlying the discussion are those of a rough and ready, often unthought out, utilitarianism. Yet this philosophy is by no means contemporary in origin. Its basic principle was formulated by Francis Hutcheson two and a half centuries ago and was injected into the bloodstream of social thought one and a half centuries ago by Jeremy Bentham. It was chiefly through the education system that Bentham and his followers, above all John Stuart Mill, influenced the thinking of an entire ruling class in this country in the second half of the 19th century. And that influence continues in our institutions down to this day. It's an outstanding example of how a philosophy, at first formulated and propagated by entirely theoretical writers, can become a practical, down-to-earth influence on the day-to-day -day lives of millions of us ordinary men and women. On the other hand, the support for utilitarianism is by no means universal. In social affairs, it's challenged by both the radical left and the radical right, and also seriously dissented from by a number of religious people. And in universities, it's coming more and more under attack from professional moral philosophers. I want to talk about this controversy later in the programme. But before I do, I want to put it in a wider context of moral philosophy in general. We have with us the Professor of Moral Philosophy at Oxford University, R. M. Hare. Professor Hare has published two books so far and a large number of articles. The books are The Language of Morals, published in 1952, and Freedom and Reason, published in 1963. But I want to go right back to the very basics of the subject and start there. Professor Hare, I think I'll do so by putting the most fundamental and simple question of all to you. What is moral philosophy? What's its field of concern? Well, I... It depends, of course, what you think philosophy is. And there are different views about this. I, myself, like to think of myself as, in the Socratic tradition, uh, Socrates, right at the beginning of philosophy, got it going by saying that you mustn't discuss important and puzzling questions without studying the concepts in which they are posed. Moral philosophy is like this, and the concepts, in its case, are the moral concepts. For example, if you're discussing the question of what would be a fair wage for a certain job, Socrates would have said, and I would agree with him, that you really can't discuss this lucidly or adequately unless you study the concept fair and know what you mean by it. Well, what are the concepts, the moral concepts, that are most interesting or most fruitful to discuss and analyse from this point of view? Well, again, different people take different views about this. Iris Murdoch wrote a book called The Sovereignty of Good, indicating, I suppose, by her title, that she thought that good was the most important concept. Other people have thought that duty was. Other people have said, don't study those very general concepts, study more particular ones, like, for example, kindness or justice. I myself have concentrated in recent years mainly on the concept ought, because I think it's the simplest of the moral concepts, and also the most central. Because after all, we want to know, don't we, in the end, what we ought to do. You've characterised the subject of moral philosophy entirely in terms of the analysis of moral concepts. But what about theories? What about models? Or what about the presuppositions of our actions or decisions or choices? Uh, the analysis of these, all these things, is a philosophical activity, and surely it's a very important Yes, one. I think that is important, but I think more important than any of those things is the study of arguments. And, of course, you study arguments by studying concepts, because by studying the concepts you discover their logical properties and, therefore, what arguments containing them are good ones and what are bad ones. But precisely what contribution can these activities, the analysis of concepts and the logic of moral arguments, what... 
What contribution does that make to the solution of practical problems? Well, could I put it, uh, put a question to you? How would you solve practical problems unless you knew which were good and which were bad arguments? And how would you know that if you didn't understand what the questions you were asking meant? Well, I'm not going to make the mistake of answering your questions because it's your answers to my questions that yes, I think yes. the viewers are interested yes. in. But one thing I had in mind when I put that question to you was this. You're an analytic philosopher. You are a philosopher, as you yourself have just said, in the tradition of Socrates. You see your function primarily in terms of the elucidation of concepts. Now, there are other kinds of philosophers. There are people like Marxists or utilitarians, for that matter. And they, they don't see philosophy in the same way as you do, and they don't regard themselves as involved in the analysis of concepts. Now, they're very confident that their different philosophical approach does make a practical difference. And I would say in the case of Marxists and utilitarians, it obviously does indeed make a practical difference, and one can see for oneself that it does. Now, what comparable practical difference does your approach make? Well, I think, in fact, I am a utilitarian in the tradition of John Stuart Mill, who perhaps was one of the best logicians we've had and one of the most aware of the need of studying concepts. The Marxists, too, I think, are utilitarians of a very different sort. Perhaps they don't see the necessity of studying concepts, and as a result, don't see the necessity of studying arguments to see whether they're good or bad ones. They just um, uh, trot them out and uh, hope you'll accept them. I mean, do you, do you regard the, the, the intellectual level of the moral philosophy being produced by Marxists as being, in consequence, low? Well, its intellectual level is high in its own way. I mean, I'm not saying that very big contributions haven't been made to our understanding of society. By, by these people. I would think that uh, Marx's contributions to, um, if you like, sociology and perhaps economics even, uh, are very great. But uh, as a contribution to philosophy, he hasn't really got the idea of what the philosopher has to do in order to, to, to give his own peculiar assistance in these questions. Well, aren't philosophers nowadays, like the Marxists uh, and the utilitarians of yesterday, turning, in fact, much more away from just the elucidation of concepts and towards direct consideration of moral dilemmas. Well, it's the from and the towards which I think is wrong there, uh, because this is what the philosopher is supposed to be doing. Suppose you rang up your plumber and said to him, uh, I've got a leak in my house, uh, come along at once, drop everything, drop all your tools, uh, come along, just mend the leak. He came along, at the same time he forgot all he ever knew about plumbing and just got on mending the leak without any tools. Well, he'd be no better able to mend the leak than I was. And that's what people are like who say that philosophers should turn away from the analysis of concepts and uh, start dealing with practical issues. I deal with practical issues quite a lot in my recent writings, but I do it by applying philosophical methods. In other words, you're saying that the, the professional tools of the philosopher are conceptual analysis That's right. and logical analysis. Yes. And if he doesn't apply those to a higher degree than other people, then he's making no special contribution. Yes, he'll be no better at it, probably worse than a great many politicians and journalists. Mm -hmm. We've been talking about Marxism, and quite apart from Marxism, there's always, I mean, since Plato, there's been... Uh, thought to be a special connection between moral philosophy and political philosophy. Yes. But in recent years, it seemed to me at least, that that connection's been wearing pretty thin. Would you make any comment on that? Well, it doesn't seem to me that it's so. There have, after all, been a great many books on this borderline, uh, some of them very good ones, some of them uh, monographs by one person, some of the collections of articles like, for example, the Laslett and Runciman series or Ted Hondrich's recent collection. Uh, there's a, there are several new magazines, one in particular I think is a very good one, Philosophy and Public Affairs, uh, it, which exist for the uh, uh, philosophical contributions to practical issues. If you look at the scene at Oxford, there is uh, a paper in the final examinations in Oxford called Theory of Politics. And it's set by the political theorists. It's marked by them and by the philosophers. Our marks uh, correspond to a very great extent. I've not seen anything 
while I've been examining that paper in the last three years, which has led me to suppose that there's a great gap between the subjects. And this may be because in Oxford, as I think elsewhere, a great many of the people teaching political theory have been trained as philosophers, and I'm sure do their political theory better because of that. What I have become aware of uh, in very recent years, I mean, just the last two or three years especially, is that especially some among the younger generation of philosophers are turning their attention to social questions which are not narrowly political. For example, economic problems, or even problems in uh, population policy. You actually have philosophers discussing population policy questions. Now, this seems to me to be something quite new. Uh, I don't know how new it is. It certainly is happening now. And I mean, in your own college of all souls, uh, there's a, a, a very able philosopher, Derek Parfit, who is doing work on population policy with some of his colleagues elsewhere in Oxford, which I think uh, is more important than anything else I know on this subject. And it's a really philosophical contribution to it. Uh, my own hobby has been environmental planning. And I've been engaged in that fairly actively since before I became a philosopher. And I honestly think that uh, being a philosopher has helped with that kind of study. I don't do it so much now, and the reason perhaps is interesting. It's because um, environmental planning, particularly transport planning, which I've been interested in, has now got much more technical than it was, and uh, that means that people who are amateurs, as I am, can't really uh, do much in it now that's worthwhile. I used to contribute articles to the technical periodicals. I don't any longer because I wouldn't dare because it's all very mathematical and, and, and difficult. Um, I think that's a paradigm of uh, what happens to the philosopher. If I wish to specialize in that subject, I would have to stop doing philosophy. When you come to these very hard, concrete, specific social questions like this, would you still deny that other kinds of philosopher, like the, the Marxist or the existentialist, uh, can make a, as big a contribution as you can? Well, they have more to say in the sense that they say more words. Their books are longer, usually, not always. But uh, although I think there are some very good philosophers in these schools, I think the commoner sort uh, do little but blow up balloons of different sizes, shapes and colours full of nothing but their own breath which float here from over the Channel or from over the Atlantic and it's very hard to tell what's in them. You can, I think, if you have a, a great deal of leisure and patience and a sharp needle I think you can prick these balloons. Uh, what's in them is very uh, intoxicating sometimes, sometimes even inflammatory. But when it's all over, has anything been done for the practical questions? In other words, what you're saying is that these rival uh, philosophical approaches tend to be very rhetorical, very wordy, lacking in logical rigor, would That's you right. say? That's it, right. It, it's rhetoric. Rigor in the, it's rhetoric. Sometimes very good. Really and of course, it has stirred up people. There's yeah. no right. It's important historically because uh, these people have affected history, perhaps in a way that unfortunately we analytical philosophers haven't yet. Uh, though, as you said at the beginning, Mill did, and he was an analytical philosopher. But they have affected history by their rhetoric, going right back to, to Hegel and uh, people like that. They've affected history enormously by their for the worse, I think. But, but they have. Perhaps it's a, a pity for analytic philosophy that it doesn't have this ability to excite masses of people. I that's think it's a inherent in the nature of the subject. I'm afraid it is, because in order, to, in order to learn the lessons that analytical philosophy is able to teach, you've got to abjure rhetoric. Um, you haven't got to, you've got to think, and that's much more difficult and much more disagreeable. As uh, Whitehead, I think it was, said, we'll, we'll do almost anything rather than think. We'll go to any lengths to avoid thinking. And the recent history of the intellectual world has, has illustrated that very well, I think. You've said that you're a utilitarian of sorts, but the, how do you answer the, the, the standard objection to utilitarianism? That because its standard is the greater happiness of the greater number, the most terrible things can be done in, in the name of this principle to minorities. I mean, there's one famous argument about if you have in a hospital somebody dying here for want of a kidney, somebody dying there for want of a kidney, somebody dying there for want of a, of a good liver, and all these people could be saved by transplants. And you have walking into this hospital, all unbeknowing, 
a perfectly well man who's come to visit a sick friend. The rational thing on utilitarian principles would be to seize the well man, dismember him, distribute his organs among the others, because that way only one man would die and three would live. If you didn't do that, three men would die and one would live. Well, philosophers are always producing uh, beautiful examples like this, but moral principles have to be devised for the actual world. And what the utilitarian will say, I think, to this kind of example is the principles we ought to have in the world, and this applies to all kinds of utilitarians, not, not just to rule utilitarians as they're called, but also to act utilitarians, the principles we ought to have are the ones which will produce the best results in the actual world. Now the actual world isn't like your case. Uh, in the actual world you could think of buckets of reasons why it would be a bad thing to do that. And uh, one of the mistakes people make, uh, one of the mis uh, mistakes in that otherwise excellent book, I think, um, uh, Nicholas Rescher's book called Unselfishness, is to suppose that a set of moral principles has got to be viable in any logically possible world. It's not so. These fantastic cases uh, are rarely irrelevant to the choice of practical principles. You were talking a moment ago about some of the very specific kinds of problems kinds of question that you've been concerned with as, as, as a moral philosopher. And it's clear from what you say that moral philosophy is an essentially hybrid subject. That is to say, it's a mixture of concerns, some of which are factual, or as the philosopher would say, empirical, and some of which are analytic, or as the philosopher might say, a priori. Now, is it different? I mean, is this so? And, and if it is so, is it different from other kinds of philosophy in that respect? Well, there are these two things, and what you say puts me in mind of Kant's famous question at the beginning of the groundwork. Yes, um, we discussed this earlier, and you brought the quotation with you. I did, uh, have you got it here I to have, hand? Uh, yes, well, I, shall I read yes, it? Yes, yes, read it. Um, it's a vague, nice piece of um, academic spleen on Kant's part, which he didn't usually indulge in, but it's in his preface. He said, would it not be better for the whole of this learned industry if those accustomed to purvey in accordance with the public taste a mixture of the empirical and the rational in various proportions unknown even to themselves, the self-styled creative thinkers as opposed to the hair splitters who attend to the purely rational part, were to be warned against carrying on at once two jobs very different in their technique, each perhaps requiring a special talent and the combination of both in one person producing mere bunglers. It's a marvellous quote. Do you actually agree with it? Uh, well, Kant goes on to say that at any rate, he isn't going to argue this point, uh, but the, the, at any rate, one's got to distinguish the two kinds of activity and know when one's doing one and when one's doing the other. When uh, one's considering factual questions it, yes. and when one's considering yes, analytic questions. But I think, actually, what's wrong with the continental schools, on the whole, is that they don't know this. They mix up they the mix two up. all the yes. time. They're, they're creative thinkers, as Kant calls them. Yes, or rhetoriticians, as you call them. Right? I don't know what, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Can we now make a, 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 a hard approach, so to speak, to what philosophers are actually doing now and have been doing in recent years in the field of moral philosophy? Yes. Uh, can you say anything about what the predominant concerns among you and your colleagues have been in recent years? Well, I think there's no doubt about it in the analytical school. Anybody would say that it is the discussion of the derivability from... Uh, factual premises of evaluative conclusions. Can you get values from facts? Can you get an ought from an is? Uh, this is not true merely of the analytic school, actually. Um, it's been happening everywhere. It's been happening between the existentialists and their opponents, although I think their discussion of the question has been much less clear and much less fruitful. When you say, can you get an ought from an is, this is, this is such a uh, a tricky uh, question and yet such a fundamental one that I perhaps you'll forgive me if I try and uh, mm. clarify yes. it a mm. little bit. Mm. I think um, the idea is, isn't it, that from no set of facts does any moral judgment or value judgment or decision or policy necessarily follow. That facts and values are literally independent of each other. Um, and also, just as, just as decisions are independent of uh, uh, facts, so facts are independent of what we might wish. Mm -hmm. And this idea is central to the science and indeed the whole intellectual culture of Western civilization. But it is disputed by some people, isn't it? Yes, I think yes, yes. perhaps I'd better give uh, an example. 
I'm quite sure that it would be contrary to what you and I would both like to believe if some scientists actually succeeded in proving that, that some group or groups of human beings are genetically less well endowed intellectually than others. It would be upsetting to discover that this was so. But if it's a fact, then it is a fact, and it's a fact independent of our wishes, mm -hmm. and we must accept it as a fact and not deny it or still less try and suppress it or prevent the scientists from publishing or lecturing or whatever it might be. Yes. In other words, the facts are independent of our wishes. But at the same time, no necessary social policy would follow from those facts. Some people might say, well, if this group is born less intelligent than other people, society needs to devote less of its resources on educating them. But others might say, no, on the contrary, if they are born less intelligent than other people, society needs to devote more of its resources to educating them. In other words, there, there's, uh, it, it's entirely open to people what policy decisions they make about the same facts. That's a very good example to illustrate the point. Now, uh, this notion as I say, it's fundamental to science and fundamental to sociology. Uh, sociologists in recent years have been trying to do what they call a value-free sociology, get the values separated from the facts. But some people dispute this, and in particular some moral philosophers in recent years have disputed that fact and value are as separate as Western science for the last three or four hundred years has maintained. Uh, which side of the dispute are you on? Well, clearly, I, I believe that uh, I'm on the same side, I think you are, that um, the, uh, the two are separate. But, of course, I don't mean by that, as some people have take, taken one to me when one says that, that the facts are not relevant to the evaluative questions. Of course, when we uh, are trying to decide a question of value, or, for that matter, trying to decide what to do, we are deciding between two concrete alternatives and what the alternatives are depends on the facts. What I mean is that suppose in your case uh, you're trying to decide whether you ought to give the uh, people uh, of supposedly inferior uh, intellectual uh, abilities more or less education. It's going to depend, isn't it, on what you'd be doing if you did either of these two things, and that depends on the consequences of doing it, and that's what you're choosing between. So it's, if I ask, ought I to give them more or ought I to give them less, the, the expression, give them more and give them less, has to be unpacked by appeal to a great many facts about the, the consequences of doing this. What this actually means in the what concrete reality right, of the yes, situation. Nobody, so far as I know, who maintains the fact-value distinction wants to maintain that you can't use facts in that way in order to, um, in, your, in your moral uh, arguments. But there are, aren't there, philosophers who want to maintain that somehow values are all mixed up with facts at the end of the road? There are. Uh, I don't think we shall have time to discuss this, but may I say that I've never seen any good argument for this view. Well, what, what convinces me that it's wrong, uh, and I would suspect you would agree with this, is that the people who maintain that you can uh, derive value statements from statements of fact have never actually succeeded in, in doing so. I mean, none of them have shown us an example yeah. in which they've succeeded no, in I doing No, I think that's right, and uh, it's true of my uh, colleagues and moral philosophers, and also, I think, of others. Well, now, who would you say are the main philosophers uh, working at the moment who disagree with you about this kind of issue? Well, uh, there are some figures uh, in the analytical philosophical world who perhaps uh, wouldn't be so well known to listeners, but uh, one thinks of uh, important moral philosophers who would be influenced by this view, like, for example, John Rawls. Now, I'm pretty sure... The professor at Harvard, uh, the American, right, uh, yes. uh, Jack Rawls, he, he um, has written a book which has been very much admired about justice. And I'm as certain as can be that he belongs to the opposite side of this controversy from us. That is, he does think that uh, uh, statements of value can be derived from statements of fact. But if you look at his book and ask, does he ever employ such an argument of a deductive kind which is valid in order to show the truth of some moral conclusion given that some factual premise. I don't think he does. I think what he does instead is to appeal to intuitions, 
to make statements with which he hopes that we will agree, and of course, very large number of people will agree, because we've been brought up that way, we have those prejudices, we share Rawls's intuitions, and that's what he hopes. But as an argument, it doesn't really um, hold together. Can you give an example of, 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 of him doing this? Well, I think I should like to set the thing in its um, uh, wider context. He's talking primarily about distributive justice, and there have been several important books about that question recently, uh, notably Rawls's book and also Robert Nozick's book. Uh, they so take, Nozick's book is what? Anarchy, uh, it's State, called Anarchy State, State Utopia. Utopia. That's and right, he, of yes. course, is also a professor at Harvard. He's also so, a professor at Harvard, yeah. too. And uh, um, it's curious that uh, people with such a similar background who produce books with such very different conclusions, both of these people, so far as I can see, appeal to intuition, largely. They appeal to what they hope their readers will agree with. And they reach almost opposite conclusions. Not quite opposite, because um, one has to take perhaps into account the egalitarians uh, as a third party, and there are many of them, and they say that uh, goods in society ought to be distributed equally if you can possibly do it. I mean, there are various qualifications to be made this, but by and large, unless there's some um, imperative necessity, uh, you ought to distribute goods in society equally. Nozick is the opposite pole from this. He says that we have a right to uh, a right of, uh, of liberty to exchange our goods with each other, provided the actual exchange is a fair one, until, if it so happens, uh, enormous inequalities are produced. Rawls falls somewhere in between these two views. He thinks that uh, the just system is one which gives the most to those who have the least, that is to say, who does the best for the least advantaged people in society, and he seems to think it doesn't frightfully matter what happens to the rest. So you have these three positions, and the funny thing is that there doesn't seem to be any argument of the sort deployed in their books which would settle the issue because all they can do is appeal to their own and their readers' intuitions, which, of course, will vary according to what political uh, side you're on. Well, then, of course, the $64,000 question is, how does one choose or adjudicate, as you say, between wholly different approaches like that? Well, I think, to be fair to Rawls, he has got um, a way of moral thinking which, if we were content to use it, and not to rely at every time on intuition, he might be able to do something. And I think it's very similar, in fact, in its logical properties to uh, ways of moral reasoning, which I myself have advocated. And this similarity has been drawn attention to by, for example, Brian, Brian Barry in his book. And I think that if Rawls had only uh, employed, as it were, the logic implicit in his system, and abjured intuitions, he really could have done much better. The reason he didn't, I think, one of the reasons is that he, if he had done that, he would have ended up as some kind of utilitarian, because there's no doubt in my mind at all that the logic of his system uh, can be used to establish utilitarianism. He, his intuitions told him he mustn't be utilitarian. No, so he, so he, he, he he didn't rely on the logic, he relied on the intuitions. Now, you've made the point very very well and very clearly that, that it's no good basing a moral approach on intuition uh, because different people have different intuitions. But does that mean that you reject intuition? Do you think we ought to, as it were, try and uh, uh, push aside or overcome or ignore our intuitions? Because we've certainly got intuitions. No, no, I don't think that. Not for a moment. Intuitions are very important, but the, they're, they're not the only thing. Uh, we have the intuitions we have because, well, we've grown up that way, brought up by our parents and by circumstances to have certain dispositions of character and uh, also dispositions to call things right and call things wrong. And we couldn't do without them because uh, we can't uh, think every moral question that confronts us out ab initio. And it would be dangerous if we did, because we'd nearly always um, cook it up so as to get conclusions palatable to ourselves, in many cases. So uh, we can't 
avoid relying upon these inbuilt dispositions of character which are called intuitions. But it's fatal to think we can rely upon them and nothing else because they conflict. Yours may conflict with mine, mine conflict with each other. And suppose my intuitions conflict with the intuitions of my children, say, or suppose they haven't got any. Suppose I ask myself, um, what should I be trying to teach my children about how to behave in, in, in this world? Or uh, suppose we're quarrelling, my children and I, about whether it is so important as I think it is to um, abjure sex outside marriage. Well, they've been convinced, say, by their contemporaries or by others of my generation, that it's quite all right. And that, that's their intuition. Uh, I think, may think that it's wrong. Well, uh, how do we go from there? We need some higher level of moral thinking, rational, critical moral thought, which will tell us what intuitions we ought to have and which we ought to discard. If you, if you, if you reject intuition as a way of deciding between incompatible arguments, and you don't believe, as you've made it clear that you don't believe, that uh, moral judgments uh, can be derived from facts, what place does that leave for reason in moral matters? I mean, what, what role is there for argument to play if you've ruled those things Well, out? I'd like to take this for main stages, because I think that uh, argument can help here, and can help much more than it's helped so far. But let's take the first stage. The first stage is that, uh, as I've implied earlier, uh, logic is employed to clarify the concepts which are used in these controversies, like the concept fair or just, and to elucidate their logical properties. That's the first stage. Uh, the second stage is this. Once you have clarified these concepts, you will be able to tell one sort of question from another. Now, uh, all these political and moral questions, they come to us as a amalgam or a melange of all kinds of different questions. You have, first of all, uh, plain ordinary questions of fact, about the prediction of the consequences of certain uh, actions, certain policies. Then you have logical questions about the nature of the concepts. And people, of course, uh, do get very much at cross purposes through not studying those questions enough. And lastly, I think, you have questions of value, which aren't, don't belong to either of those two classes, and uh, they have no doubt to be dealt with separately. Now, the second contribution of the philosopher is to take all these different classes of questions apart and uh, say that the um, factual ones can be settled by the methods of empirical investigation and the uh, logical ones can be settled and uh, sorted out, elucidated by the uh, methods of philosophical logic. And that leaves you with the evaluative questions which, when you've got rid of the rest, may be, in fact, easier of solution. But that, of course, depends on your view about uh, moral philosophy. But how can you apply logic to these purely value questions? That really is the most important question in moral philosophy at the present time, as it has always been. And it's been most important to get it separate from the others. That's what I've been trying to do all this time, to get it uh, free from the uh, interference of these other questions. And you ask me, quite rightly, how can logic help? Now, well, if my views are correct about the nature of the, of, the, of the moral concepts, then I think logic can help. And that, of course, is a very important claim. But I, I think that if I'm right about the logical character of the moral concepts, then uh, there is a way forward in answering these questions. My views, do you want me to tell you about my views? My, my views, in a way, are um, very similar to Kant's, though um, I hesitate to say that because I'm never entirely sure what exactly Kant is saying. He is such a very obscure writer. But what I want to say about the moral concepts is that they have two properties which, uh, together, suffice to produce a logic for moral argument. The first is the one which philosophers call universalizability, which means 
roughly that any judgment, any moral judgment I make about a case, I must make about any precisely similar case. The second property which I think moral judgments have is the one called prescriptivity, which says that uh, moral judgments of the central kind, of course there are other moral judgments to which this doesn't apply, but uh, central and typical moral judgments have a bearing on our actions. If we believe them, uh, then we will act in accordance with them. Now I think those two properties by themselves do suffice to generate a logic which can really help with moral arguments. You're now beginning to talk as if uh moral philosophy is a branch of logic, or at least is in one of its aspects a branch of logic. Well, I think it is. We've, we've stressed most of all in our discussion so far the importance of logic in moral yes. argument and moral discussion, but I'd like you now to say a little, a little more about the importance of, of the factual element in all this. Well, the essential thing is that it is the facts, as I, I indeed I, I did say before, which determine between what you're choosing, I mean, if I'm wondering whether to do something or not to do it, then what makes the difference is that if I do it, I'll be doing so and so and so and so, and if I don't do it, I'll be doing something else. And uh, that is what makes it a choice, that's what makes the difference between uh, doing one and doing the other, and of course that's what I'm making my moral judgment about. So of course I have to take account of the facts. Can you give any examples of factual uh, considerations which you think ought to actually affect our choice of moral principles? Take the question as to whether you should um, uh, fight in wars. That's a good example. Well, uh, a good example, a very obvious example. Now, it's obviously one of the, one of the uh, reasons against fighting in wars, one of the, the arguments in favour of pacifism, which actually I don't hold, but uh, one of the arguments in favour of pacifism is what it's like for people to uh, have to uh, suffer from the consequences of war. I mean, one of the reasons why, uh, one of the reasons against, uh, for example, the, the Americans engaging the Vietnam War was the uh, extreme, appalling sufferings which happened as a result of that war. Now, that's an example. Uh, now, if the Americans or anybody else um, had a principle which required them to do that kind of thing, then that was something against that principle. Of course, there might be other reasons why they ought to have done it all the same. I think there was in the case of uh, uh, our own war in 1939. I think that the, uh, although the war brought, brought enormous sufferings, probably it would have been worse if we hadn't engaged in it. But um, you have to look at those facts in order to tell what principles are the ones you should adopt. And I wouldn't adopt an absolutely rigid pacifist principle because I think the consequences of everybody having such a principle would be much worse than the consequences of, of, of having the principles I do in fact have, which do allow me to fight in certain wars. We've covered a lot of ground in this discussion, Professor Hare. We've talked about the role of logic in moral arguments, about the role of factual considerations, the role of intuition, uh, the somewhat complicated ways in which these are interrelated with each other. I think it would be very interesting to finish the discussion by now looking at some of your own work in the light of these manifold considerations that have arisen. You said I think right at the beginning of the discussion, you raised the question of, of what constitutes a fair wage. Yes. And you, you, you said that this is something that interested you. Uh, you. You contrasted your views on some social questions with those of other philosophers like Rawls and Nozick you mentioned. Can you now tell us, uh, using as a specific example your own work on a particular concept, tell us something about uh, how you go about investigating a concept like this as a philosopher. Well, that's really the best example of all, I think, because it's so topical now and, and so important and our uh, society maybe is going to fall to pieces for lack of a philosophical understanding. And I do think that philosophers uh, can, if only people would listen to them, uh, help with these questions. Well, you have the old age pensioner who thinks it's wrong, unfair, if they're going to 
die of hypothermia because the price of fuel has gone up so much. And you have the miners who think it's wrong that they can't get more wages because uh, they think they deserve them, and that it's unfair for them not to have more wages. Well, now, how does one set about answering a question like this? On my view, one sets about it by asking, what are the principles of justice, of fair distribution of goods in society, whose acceptance by society would be the best, on the whole, for the people in that society? Now, if we could find a set of principles of fair distribution, uh, which would be accepted by society and would distribute goods in such a way that uh, it was for the best for the people of that society taken as a whole, then we'd be out of all our troubles. And I think that uh, if you understand that, that it isn't a question just of uh, nailing your flag to some conception of fairness which you've uh, learnt, say, from uh, your uh, uh, compeers or uh, something you've seen in the newspapers. Uh, and people, of course, do, uh, they stick up for their rights and, and, and uh, they think it's obvious to them what rights they have. And they nail their flag to these rights, uh, um, to these conceptions of fairness. And that's why we come to blows with each other. Now, if we could, instead of doing that, ask ourselves what conception of fairness ought we to have? What conception of fairness would it be best for us to have in society? It's conceivable we might agree. Now, how do you pursue the search? How do you, as a philosopher, start setting about trying to find an answer to your own question? Well, of course, I may have to hand over this point to other disciplines because the uh, philosopher can only say, this is the question which you want to address yourself. Uh, I think I put the question in a new way. I think I've explained what it is you've got to find, what you're looking for, and it is for people such as, for example, economists and social scientists generally, to look for possible solutions. But I think that they, even these uh, extremely able men, sometimes uh, don't uh, find the solutions because they are not absolutely clear about what they're looking for. And this is really what the philosopher has to, to help with. Do you sometimes feel as a philosopher that the people in these other spheres, the politicians for example, yes. don't take sufficient note of the kind of clarification of the issues or the concepts involved or the arguments used that you and your fellow philosophers are providing? Well, uh, I think some of them do and some of them don't because of course there are some, some philosophically sophisticated politicians like yourself. But I, I do think that uh, in the current discussion of questions like this, uh, you will find words like fair, rights, just, and such concepts used, even sometimes by philosophers, as if uh, it was obvious what was fair or what was right. You didn't have to ask yourself whether your own intuitions about fairness uh, ought to be called into question. And I think if people would question their intuitions or call them prejudices about what's fair and what's right a little bit more and try to understand other people, intuitions and prejudices, then there will be more chance of us reaching agreement with one another. And central to your whole view is that this uh, mutual understanding depends not only on sympathy or compassion, but also the application of reason to moral questions. Is right, yes, yes. Thank you very much, Professor Hare.